You guys would stand with us and join us for this uh, for this next song. There is strength within the sorrow. There is beauty in our tears. And you meet us in The love that casts out fear. You are working in our waiting. You're sanctifying us. When beyond our understanding, you're teaching us to trust. not forgotten us you're with us in the fire and the flood you're faithful forever perfect in love you are sovereign over us you are wisdom Understand your ways, reigning high above the heavens, reaching down in endless grace. You're the lifter of the lowly, compassionate and kind. Surround and you uphold me, and your promises are my delight. Your plans are still to prosper, you have not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire and the flood. You're faithful forever, perfect. in the fire and the flood you're faithful forever you're perfect in love you are sovereign over us even what the enemy means for evil you turn it for our good you turn it for our good for your glory even in the valley you are faithful you're working for our good you're working for our good for your glory even what the enemy means for evil you turn it Turn it for our good, for your glory. Even in the valley, you are faithful. You're working for our good. You're working for our good, for your glory. Your plans are still to prosper. You have not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire and the flood. You're faithful forever, perfect in love. You are sovereign over us. You're faithful forever, perfect in love. You are sovereign over us. Amen. You may have a seat.
Well, good morning. I'm Rich Moore. This is my wife, Kim. We have some announcements for you this morning. You're on, dear. Okay, me first. All right. Um, like every Sunday, you hear me come up and say, there's this connection card. Um, it's really important. Our pastors really want to hear from you, and they want to connect with you. So if you have any prayer requests, if you could put them um, on this card. Hand them in the baskets in the back of the church. If you're a visitor, though, here with us for the very first time, welcome. We have a gift for you, so fill this out. Take it a little bit further out there to the ministry center. We have a, um, a gift for you. Are you doing that? You doing that? Sure. Okay. <laughs> So Thursday is the event of the season, and I'm a part of the committee, so we're really excited. It's Ladies' Night Out. It is at 6.30 here at the church, and it, we have a lot in store for you, a lot of fun things planned, but also just really nice time to get together with other ladies in the church. So mark your calendars for Thursday night at 6.30. And uh uh, Justin Putnam and I are doing a, a new marriage class. It's called Experiencing God's Dream for Your Marriage. And whether you've been married a long time or a short time, uh, you're free to join us. And we're just going to go through some principles that God has for marriage and how to encourage your marriage and get better. And then Pastor Greg's going to be talking. We're going to have a communion service coming up later uh, in this month, and he's going to talk to you a little bit about that. Shall we stand for prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for this day. We thank you for the opportunity we have to come before you, to quiet our hearts, Lord, and just stop, to stop from our busyness of our lives, from the noise going around us in the political scene, in the world, and we see all the bad things, all the bad news, and yet, Lord, we know that you are in control. We thank you, Father, that we have a God who we can pray to, who knows everything. And that you have our best interest at heart. We praise you, Lord, for your son, Jesus. And that, Father, you've given us the perfect gift of eternal life. All we have to do, Lord, is ask. This morning, Lord, as we worship you, we just pray, Father, that you would touch our hearts anew. Come in, revive us, refresh us, renew us, Lord, so that we can be a guiding light to those around us. We pray this morning for Greg as he brings the message, Father, touch his heart as he pours out scripture to us and the words that you'd have to speak to us. Lord, open our minds and our hearts that we would draw your scripture into us and feed off your living word. For all the good things, Lord, that happen, we will always give you all the glory and all the praise. In your precious name I pray, amen. No, I see you, stand back up. Sorry, I don't mean to point you out. Water you turned into wine Open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you None like you Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you Unlike you, our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our 
Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God, our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand to cast? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand to cast? Then what could stand?
joy in every season. You are worthy in every moment. You're wonderful. You're wonderful. You're wonderful. We won't be silent. Our hearts on fire. Jesus, our victory. The sound of triumph. The song is inside us Jesus our victory we won't be silent our hearts on fire Jesus our victory the sound of triumph the song inside us Jesus our victory Take a few minutes and shake some hands and spread some love. Good morning. We're glad that you are here and taking a look at our service this morning. Right now, this time is called the seven in seven time. And what we do is we take prayer requests from our church audience, then we have a chance to be able to pray for them at that point in time. So sometimes we don't know exactly what's going to be shared. Sometimes they're of a sensitive nature that might happen to be shared. So what we would like to do during this time frame on our live stream is to just give you the announcements that on a regular basis, ask you maybe to take some time right now and pray uh, just for those things that are being shared, even though you don't have a chance to hear them. And uh, we will be back to our normal programming in just a moment as soon as this prayer time is over. Thank you for joining us today. We're glad that you are with us. Have a great day.
forward and we're going to have an offering. We have our normal offering, but um, we had mentioned that we wanted to also try to um, take a special offering for the Karis Alliance, which um, the question that I had posed to me a couple of times was, where does that money go if we take a special offering for the Karis Alliance? And um, uh, the, the bigger part of those funds go to, see, if we're a, this global network all around the world, the greater part of those funds will go to some of the third world countries um, in order to assist them in church planting and to assist them in, in, with their national leaders in some of the things that they're trying to do as a movement. Uh, and at the same time, every couple of years, those national leaders all come together, and it's very difficult for the national leaders to afford plane tickets and travel arrangements to get to a central location. So um, our, our offering will primarily go to help those third world country leaders get together and find ways where they can talk about how, as a global network, we can do a better job of reaching the world for Jesus Christ. So if you did mark your envelopes any differently, if you wanted to mark them for the Karis Alliance, you can do that. If you have a special offering that maybe you've collected or, de or decided to set aside for them, you can do that as well. Um, this isn't limited only to today, so if you would like to um, maybe try to think about that and see if you want to help in any other way above and beyond, you can still do that this month. But um, today was the day we're supposed to try to create that special uh, assignment. So um, anyway, that's what we're doing today. Thank you all for being here. I'm glad that you're here. And let's go ahead and pray and, and take our offering up. Father, we thank you for all that you do in our lives. Thank you, God, for your great and mighty love for us. Thanks for this chance we've had to pray for those countries around the world that we've been involved in in the past in uh, trying to plant churches and trying to raise up leaders who will lead those churches and trying to spread the gospel. God, I thank you for this little church here in Osceola and the impact that we have had over the many years to um, be able to be a part of spreading the gospel around the world. God, we thank you and praise you for that. I pray that you would allow us to continue with our efforts in reaching people for Christ. And I pray, God, that the, the alliance, this Karis alliance, would be one that, as we're part of it, we can network with them and see your hand at work all around the globe. God, we love you and we praise you. Thank you for this chance we have right now to take an offering and to show um, you through this form of worship, through giving and trusting of you, um, of the way that you have given to us and provided to us. We pray, God, that as we give something back, that um, you would be pleased and that you would be honored. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Our church is part of a vibrant global movement. Ever wonder how it all began? By the early 1700s, churches across Europe were embroiled in conflict. Many had lost sight of the reason Jesus formed his church to deliver the message of grace and hope. However, in one corner of Germany, a small group of men and women recommitted to reading their Bibles and obeying its message. In 1708, they took the bold step of forming a new church, based upon the example they saw in the New Testament. This growing church drew the ire of the local rulers. To avoid persecution, they immigrated to the Americas and, over time, formed hundreds of churches. Yet something was missing. Among the final words of Jesus is the command to make disciples of all nations. Obeying Jesus means taking his message to others by crossing barriers of geography, language and culture. For us, this began in 1900. Slowly at first, then with more speed, we sent workers to many distant places. Before long, these new churches were also sending out workers. Recently, we named our movement, the Caris Alliance. Caris means grace. Above all, we want to be witnesses to the grace of God, poured out upon the world through His Son, Jesus Christ. While we all share the same family history and core beliefs, we encourage our churches to adopt methods appropriate to the culture where God places them. So, what do we have in common? We share a commitment to biblical truth. The Bible determines what we believe and guides what we do. We share a commitment to biblical relationships. We respect and support one another. We work hard to obey Jesus' command to love one another as I have loved you. We share a commitment to biblical mission. We are committed to planting new churches, training new leaders, and doing good in our communities. Yes, our church is excited to belong to a family of churches that shares a common history, beliefs, and values. A family of churches called the Caris Alliance. Today, we join churches around the globe in celebrating what God has done. 
and we invite both your prayers and financial support to bless the Caris Alliance. May our generosity today serve as fuel for our growing movement. back the gates we open the door together we come to meet with you Lord we push back the gates we open the door together we come
so much. That was excellent. That's a perfect introduction to uh, where we're going today with, um, with the message because we have a um, message today where we're going to be looking at the authority of Jesus Christ. And to be able to hear some of those words, I don't know if, you, um, if you've uh, process some of those, but take a look at it even if you want to on the internet and look up threshold of glory. That's what that was called. And um, take, it, take a look at that on the internet, kind of look at some of those lyrics, but the idea of pushing back evil and the idea of, um, of us even charging those gates and being on that threshold of glory and being able to see um, Jesus for who he is. And so when we look at this message today and see some of the text and see some of the authority of Jesus, uh, it, it really it really causes me to ask the question, why do we wait when in responding to the authority of Jesus? Why, do, why does it seem like we, um, we, we respond to all kinds of other authority, and yet when the authority of Jesus is laid out, for some reason we hesitate, for some reason we question it. And um, so we're going to look at this and, and see in, in the book of Mark some of the interesting um, ways that people were initially responding to Jesus. But before we get started with that, uh, I wanted to just explain something to you about next Sunday night. Next Sunday night is our communion service. And uh, next Sunday night we have, uh, well, here in the, in the fellowship, in our Grace Brethren Fellowship, we, we do communion different uh, than, than maybe a lot of people do. A lot of churches do what's called just the bread and the cup, the remembrance of Jesus, the um, taking the, the, the bread and remembering him, his body that was broken and taking the, drinking the cup of grape juice is what we use, uh, that, and we drink that and, we, and to remember the blood that was shed. And that's, we do that, but that's one of, uh, one of three parts that we do when we do our communion service. Uh, that's actually what we'll, we'll close the evening out with next Sunday night. But we start with a meal together because when you take a look at the different times uh, in the Gospels where Jesus was, in each of those Gospels, where Jesus was uh, introducing the idea of the bread and the cup and the idea that his disciples would do that together, they were sitting around a meal doing it together at a meal. And so what we do is we have a meal together. For us, um, it helps us to be able to look forward to the ministry of Christ that we're going to see in the future at the marriage feast of the Lamb. It's sort of like when we, when we sit down and have a meal together as a church family, it's, a, it's sort of like a rehearsal dinner for the wedding feast of the Lamb that's going to happen as it's described in, in uh, Revelation. So that's why we do the meal together. And sometimes it's a real simple meal. Sometimes it's a little more elaborate. And, um, and so we just we kind of do it differently uh, each time. And, uh, and so there's a, a group of people that put that meal together, and they do a wonderful job. And, and we just have a really nice time sitting around tables and talking together and uh, talking about lots of things, what's going on in our lives right now, and sometimes what we're looking forward to in the future uh, as far as what Christ is going to do. But um, the second part that we do is called the foot washing. And if you take a look in, in the book of John, um, John 13, you don't need to look it up. I just want to um, read you one little portion of this because Jesus explains, see, when we see that in the book of John, in John 13, it's, it's that same context around a meal, and it's, it's the same idea of when Jesus was introducing the bread and the cup, but when he, um, when he was doing that, and he, it says after the meal, he got up and he um, began to wash his disciples' feet. And the interesting thing about that is if you were washing people's feet in that time period, you really weren't doing it after a meal. You were doing it when they first came into the house. So Jesus was doing something that was completely out of the norm. And the second thing apart it was, a part of the, that was surprising about it was the fact that, that Jesus was doing something that normally a servant would do. Normally the, the, the host or the star of the party wasn't going to be the guy who then goes around and washes people's feet. And yet Jesus was willing to, to humble himself and to, and to take that um, initiative and do that. And he explains to his disciples why he's doing it. And in John 13, it says, When he had washed their feet, he put on his outer garments and resumed his place. And he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. So Jesus was at that point instituting this idea that we should do this for each other. And so every time we do communion, we do this for each other. We wash each other's feet. Now, just so you know, um, most of the people, I don't know about everybody because I don't check, but most of the people, I think, probably make sure their feet are clean before they come. 
but we don't really sit down and we're not scrubbing all the dirt off people's feet. We're, we're really, it, we splash a little bit of water on each other's feet and, the, and there's, a, there's a purpose for that. The purpose is, is to identify the idea of, of us needing to be clean daily and confessing our sin. And you can read that in John 13 and you can see that there. But um, anyway, that's, that's one of the things that we do. Jesus says, for I have given you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. So if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So Jesus was actually saying, if you follow through and you do the bread and the cup, and you, you know, as you're doing that around some sort of a meal where you can fellowship together, and as you, if you would wash each other's feet, it's an opportunity to be blessed by God if you do those things. So that's why we do them. I just want to warn you in advance, if you want to come to communion next Sunday night, you are all welcome to come. Um, I just don't want you to be freaked out by what we do. Because it's, it's, I'll admit, it's, it's different than the norm. But let me tell you something about it. I, it's the very first time I did it, I was, a, a, I think, like a sophomore or junior in high school. And it sort of was weird to me. But it's actually one of the most special moments. And I've just come to love the, the whole way that we do communion. And so I want to invite you to come and be part of that and uh, just join with us. And, and as we do that, it kind of does what we just saw witnessed uh, in, the, in the dance there, is it sort of brings us a little bit to that threshold of glory to see a little bit about what Jesus meant for us to do and to experience that and to sit back and remember what he's done for us to help us be reconciled to God. So as we would think about that for next week, I just want to enjoy, or I just want to invite you to come and enjoy that with us. Um, it's a really exciting time, and to be part of that, I want to invite you to come do that with us. So we'll mention it again next week to remind you, but um, please do that with us. If you would right now, let's, let's just bow our heads, and, um, and let's just enter into the presence of God here as we would think about what um, we're going to learn here out of Mark chapter 1. Father, I pray that you would just work in our hearts, work in our minds. God, I just pray that you would, even right now, um, just help my um, voice to hold out through this and just to be able to um, speak clearly. <clears throat> and I pray, God, that you would just, uh, you would be honored through all of this. Father, help me, um, even as I share, to not speak to um, anything that would bring glory to myself, but that all glory would be directed toward you, God. You are amazing. You deserve all of the glory, all of the honor. And we pray, God, that today you would be pleased. Father, help us today to go away changed as a result of the things we look at here about Jesus Christ, your son. And as we look at them and understand more about the level of authority that he had that you granted to him and how he utilized that to be able to give you glory and honor. Father, we love you. We praise you. Thank you for filling us with your Holy Spirit. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you would, take a look. <clears throat> take a look right now at um, Mark chapter one. We're gonna look at 21 to 27 today, and I wanna just read that for you. But the question I have, and it's the title of the message, is why would we wait in responding to Jesus? All of these words, I want you to notice the word immediately a couple of different times in here. <clears throat> and look at the, <clears throat> look at the response of the, of the people as Jesus exerts his authority and as he speaks. Look at how he responds. It says, And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed. So that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Isn't it interesting to see how people noticed how Jesus came into their midst 
and was able to exert authority in a couple of different ways. We're going to look right now at the examples of the authority of Jesus. We want to look at, at two parts of it, really. And, the, and they're right there in your bulletin, um, in the notes that you've got. We're going to look at two parts of his authority. The two things that the people that were present there saw about Jesus were this. First, he taught in the synagogue with authority. And second, he commanded the spiritual world with authority. Two things that um, you would think would be extremely interesting. See, Jesus really wasn't actually raised to be a rabbi. He wasn't raised to be a teacher. He was raised as a carpenter, and he was the son of a carpenter, and that's, and that's the lifestyle that he was raised for. And yet, when Jesus, we've already seen um, early on that Jesus was baptized and that the Holy Spirit came upon him and that he was serving and, and he was beginning to start his ministry as a as a basically a traveling teacher. He called people. We saw that last week when Pastor John was preaching. We, we saw that he called people and they came and they followed him and those were his first disciples. So when we see all of that unfold and we see that beginning to happen, Jesus, this is the interesting thing about it. Synagogues, um, I don't remember if I told you this before or not, but synagogues weren't really around um, early on. The, during the Babylonian period, while all of the Jewish people were in exile of some form. They actually were allowed to create places of worship, and they called them synagogues. So they built these synagogues, and the synagogues ended up becoming um, places of um, where public, publicly the, the people would meet, sometimes to worship, sometimes to study, sometimes as a community center, sometimes to, to handle the legal issues of the, of the Jewish people, even though they were in a broader context of a foreign nation. So they had these synagogues that popped up, and then that just began to be the place where Jewish people, whenever they would move into a new area, they would build a synagogue, and they would begin to worship there, and that was their, this kind of the center of their community. So it was sort of tradition that if a new person came in and wanted to teach, that they would grant them that permission to teach. And, it, and really, it, it sort of depended on... Um, the, the, the content and everything, but every Jewish, every good Jewish man knew the kind of things he was to teach, and he would read from the Old Testament, and he would usually just stand up and read from the Old Testament and maybe just explain a little bit about it. But the scribes oftentimes, um, and, the, and that's what it, it compares, that passage there compares him to the scribes, and it, and it just says um, that he taught differently than the scribes. He taught with authority, it says, the scribes typically just repeated the things that, that were in Scripture, and then they would, they would basically really just say, here's what we're supposed to do. But Jesus, for some reason, and we don't really know what the difference was, because we don't get a chance here to see it, but he taught with authority so much so that the people there were astonished at the way that he taught. Because first of all, he wasn't trained. I mean, it was, it was apparent he wasn't trained, and yet for some reason he had this amazing ability to engage an audience and to present to them the word of God, and he could speak with authority about it. Now, you know why that is, right? That he could speak with authority. One, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. That's part of everything that he's doing because um, he's one with the Spirit. But you, you also realize he's the author of all of the stuff he was teaching from. He's the, he's the one who wrote the whole Old Testament. I mean, not, not literally wrote it because men wrote it, but the Word of God teaches us that all Scripture is inspired and that it was God-breathed. And that it says that Jesus, in John chapter 1, it describes Jesus as being the Word, the Word of God. So he's the living Word of God. What we have in our hands is the written Word of God, which is also living and active, it says in Hebrews, and it's able to judge the thoughts and intentions of our heart. Jesus Christ was the one who, who was the author of the Old Testament. So if you've written something, then you can speak from something and read it to somebody and then tell them exactly what the intent was behind it, because you're the author. That's the beautiful thing about it. Jesus didn't even have to explain that. He could just, he didn't say, I wrote this. He just said, here's what was written. Let me explain what that means. And he unpacked it in such a way that they realized he knows, he gets it. It's real. And he had authority. I think it's interesting that when we think sometimes about the, the, the authorities in our lives, you know, I, I, was, I was trying to think about this. When we there are all these emergency vehicles out there, right? I mean, the paramedics drive the ambulance and and the fire trucks and the police vehicles that are out there, when they come down the road 
lights going, we tend to pull over. We're supposed to anyway. I mean, I don't know about you, but I pull over. Um, just not too long ago, I um, was driving along. Every once in a while, I'm, I'm sure this isn't true of you, but every once in a while, it's true of me that I sort of daydream while I'm driving along. And I'm driving along Lincoln Way, um, right in the Twin Branch area, headed toward um, Capitol Avenue. And I'm driving along there, and up in front of me, there's this car in the lane, kind of to, in the middle lane next to me. And he's, he's driving along there, and I'm looking, I'm like, what is all over that car? And then I realized, oh, okay, there, there are lights on top of it. It must be some sort of a police vehicle or something, but there's something weird all over it. So I'm, I'm driving along, not thinking about the fact that I'm gaining on this car. So I've gained on this car, and, and as I'm gaining on it, it says police across the back. And I'm like, oh, well, that's interesting. What kind of a police car is that? So I continue to drive, and I continue to gain on it, and I get closer, and it's got these all these Mishawaka things all over it, like something from Mishawaka High School. It's got these little handprints all over the side of it, and I'm thinking, what did they do to that car? And so I continue to drive up, and I get up next to it, and I'm looking at the car, and I'm like, oh, it's one of those dare cars. Okay, so that's what it is. And so I'm looking at the thing and driving along, and I'm, I'm thinking, well, that's really kind of cool. I like that. I wonder who did that. And all these thoughts are going through my mind as I pass the police car. <laughs> And I continue to just keep going, and I pass the police car, and I get up a little ahead, and right now we're about down to where the McDonald's is there on Lincoln Way. And, uh, and, I'm, and I'm just, in my own little brain, I'm just going, oh, well, that was kind of cool. And I'm just, you know, driving along. And, I'll, and in my rearview mirror, I see this car pull over behind me, and the lights come on. And I'm like, what am I doing? And I pull over, of course. And, in the, and the officer yelled at me. Um, because of all of the things I just described and all of the things you were just thinking, like, what in the world are you doing? Why are you passing a police car? I, we're going, I was already going just a little over the speed limit, and you passed me. I mean, all of those things that you probably thought weren't going through my mind until I got stopped, and that officer yelled all of those things at me because um, he was really disgusted at the fact that I would just I would exceed the speed limit that he was already exceeding, exceeding which he admitted to me. So, I mean, I guess we both deserved a ticket. I don't know. But he then, he, he yelled at me for a little while and told me to knock it off and slow down and drive more carefully. And he got back in his car and he tore off. And I sat there and I went, what just happened to me? But the thing is, so I should have been thinking about the authority that he had while I was passing him. And I wasn't. But as soon as those lights came on, that authority immediately kicked in and I pulled immediately over and waited with my hands on the wheel and the window down and just waited to see what was going to happen. And, and uh, it's, it's interesting how we respond to authority. All of the authorities we're used to. And yet what I think is most interesting to me is when we look at something in the word of God and we read it and we say, hmm, well, I'm, that's, that's certainly true of so-and-so, but um, I'm, I don't want to have to do that. I don't want to have to obey that. I don't like the way that makes me feel if I, if I continue to live this life I'm living. I, we, we look at it, and we somehow don't see the Bible or even what Jesus has told us through his words in the Bible, however you want to phrase that. We, we have trouble seeing that with the authority that we would see lights coming on on a police vehicle and pulling over. There's an immediate response mechanism that happens in us when an emergency vehicle goes by with lights blaring. There's an immediate response that just happens. And yet, when we read something in the word of God and there needs to be an immediate response, for some reason, we rationalize away why we're not gonna do it. We question it. You realize you're questioning, I shouldn't say you, we. When we do that, we question the very authority of the creator of the universe. I mean, what is that? How, how do we do that? How do we in any way in our mind justify questioning the authority of the very one who created us? Yet we do. And we do it time and time and time again. And, and folks, even, even some of the best of you, even, even some of you that, that just can't help but doing good all the time, even, even you, and, and you might not even know who you are, but you, the, well, we know who you are because I, I don't do good all the time. And I, and I know who you are, the ones who do good all the time. And 
you, uh, yeah, like Rusty. Rusty does good all the time. He just raised his hand. Put your hand down. I know you. I watched you get raised, son. We know the ones who do good all the time, but even the ones who do good seemingly all the time still have those moments where you know you question, and you probably don't do it and acknowledge it, but you know that there's something you ought to have done and you didn't do it, or there's something you shouldn't be doing that you are doing, and yet we do it. And this passage, I think, is so interesting because it says that they were astonished at the fact that, that he was teaching with authority, not as the scribes. And, and, that, and that when he did so, people began to respond. And you'll, and you'll see that because if you look ahead a little bit, if you read in a couple of the other gospels, it's not long before Jesus is no longer in the synagogues, probably for two reasons. One, the Pharisees didn't like the fact that he was teaching with authority, and so they asked him not to come back. That's, that's a possibility. Um, you can see that just through the fact that he's no longer, eventually he's no longer in there teaching. But secondly, the crowds got so big that no longer could a, a synagogue contain them when they come to listen, came to listen to him teach. Isn't it interesting when the authority of the word of God is preached, how, believe it or not, even when we don't like hearing it, we still come back to hear more when we see that the one who is teaching it has an understanding of what it looks like and, and they continue to want to learn more because it was something new. It was something different. It was refreshing. It wasn't just a list of do's and don'ts, but it was really more of a, here's why we do this. Here's why we should do this. And Jesus had this engaging opportunity to be able to, to reach people in a different sort of a way. But he did so with authority. That's amazing. Then we're going to look at some examples here of his authority. And, the, and two of them are right there. I mean, the one, in, one is in the, the way that he taught. But, but secondly... Um, it, it was also in the way that he commanded the spiritual world. And as you, as you take a look at that, um, it's, really, it's really quite interesting that, um, actually, before we go there, I, one more thing about his authority as he, as he taught. Um, because this is, they began to ask him, where do you get the authority to even say these things? And in the book of John, uh, verse 28, that's actually the next passage I think I want you to see up here. Um, John 8, 28, it says this, as they're asking him, you know, how he can say such things about the relationship that he has with God the Father. This is what Jesus says to them. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, which he's predicting the fact that he's going to be lifted up and crucified. He says, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he. And that I do nothing on my own authority, but I speak just as the Father taught me. He said things like that, and, and that, just, that just blew people away. Because he was saying things like that, and they knew what he was saying was he's calling God his father. That's unheard of in that day. And he was, he was claiming to be the son of God. He was claiming to be the Messiah. But he said, it's not my authority. It's the authority of God the father. That's, that's where I'm speaking from. So as we look at Jesus' authority, let's, let's just ex explore this just a little bit here um, because I really want us to actually, you, you, you saw the one in there about him throwing out the demons and, and how he did that. Um, that, to me, there, I guess there's another part of that that we have to look at because when he throws out that demon, he even commands that demon to be quiet. He does that often. If you look through the Gospels, when he, when he casts out a demon, he will tell those demons to, to be quiet. Do not say who I am. He, he, wanted, he wanted it to be um, on his timing, on the timing of the Father as he was being revealed. But when we look forward a little bit, we need to, we need to understand a little bit more about the authority of Jesus. That's really, that's really what I think we need to look at today, and we, we've got just a few minutes left to look at this. But um, there's some verses there. You should go back and look those verses up under exploring the authority of Jesus. There's several of them, Ephesians and Colossians. We're going to look at a few of them today, but I, I, just, I want you to just think through that. Because this wasn't just Jesus claiming his own authority. This wasn't just his apostles claiming that he had authority. They weren't just acting in his name just to try to play a trump card on people and, and say, well, you know, I, I, we, we, 
um, we know Jesus, so we get in the gate. I mean, that wasn't their deal. That wasn't how it worked. They, they basically were living out the authority that Jesus had given them. And when they wrote the Gospels and when they wrote the rest of the New Testament under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you see time and time and time again about the authority and the superiority of Jesus Christ. It wasn't just Paul writing about it, but that's a couple of the things we're going to look at today. But it was each of the writers in some way or another expressed the importance of Jesus' authority over the entire rest of everything else you could ever imagine. I, don't even, I mean, I could limit it to people, but it's not just people. He was, his authority extended over the entire universe. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul's writing to the church there at Ephesus, and he's talking about the fact that I've heard about your faith, I've heard about your love for Jesus Christ, I don't ever stop praying for you guys or giving thanks for what God has done in your life. He, he writes about those things to them, um, and then he, he, he says, I'm praying for you in a lot of different ways, but as he, as he says that, then in verse 20, look what he says. He says um, that he worked in Christ, this is talking about God the Father, the, what, what, what he worked in Christ when he, God the Father, raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Now look at this. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. We don't even know about the age to come. I mean, we do, we can read in the book of Revelation, but we don't know what the age of eternity looks like for us. Just little glimpses that we can see. But it says in verse 22, and he put all things under his feet and he gave him as head over the things to the church, over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. When you think about that, that picture that, that he has he has placed him far above all rule. And he, in case you're wondering about what, the, you know, what that means, rule or rulers, or, or, or he says, well, and authority. Okay, so maybe you don't want to talk about the authorities. Well, maybe the authorities have, have a position, but they don't have power. Well, oh, no, no. Well, instead, it's far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. I mean, he pretty much covers all of the possible bases He's not just repeating different words. Those words each have a little bit of a different meaning and connotation behind them so that we understand that, that he placed him far above that, not just a little bit above that, not just slightly above that. He placed Jesus Christ far above all of the authorities, all of the power, all of the rule, all of the dominion. He established that by raising him from the dead and helping conquer the power of death. That's the authority that Jesus has. And then to say that he's put everything else under his feet and that his name is going to be magnified above every possible name. I mean, you can't beat that. You can't, you can't beat your name being above every possible other name. Then there's nothing else you can make up. There's nothing else there. Look at the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verses 13 to 16. It says, he has delivered us from the dominion of darkness. This is about the, the role of the father in, in the life of the son. He says, he has delivered us from the dominion of darkness, and he's transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Do you understand what that means for us as a believer, as a follower of Jesus? I mean, just think about this. You were at one point under the dominion of darkness. If you were a follower of Jesus today, you're not any longer into that dominion of darkness. You are now in the kingdom of his beloved son. You're in the kingdom of light. That's a, that's a big, huge difference from darkness to light, from death to life. And, and that dominion that was over us is no longer there over us any longer because it says we were transferred. We were pulled out of that and placed into the kingdom of light, into the kingdom of the son of God. That's where we were placed when we just chose to follow Jesus. When, when he brought us to that place where we knew we needed to follow him and then we gave in and we followed him, that's where, that's where we're at right there. It says, in him or in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. It's only through him. He is the image of the invisible God, uh, invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. You see it all over again, folks. He's listing out every possible idea because if you want to make the excuse that, well, I don't fit in that category, you do. 
And he has dominion over all of those. He has power over all of those things. It says all things were created through him and for him. All things were created through him and for him. There's two different ideas right there. He was, the, he was the avenue through which everything was created. But secondly, the reason that he did it was for his own glory. It had nothing to do with you and me. I, I realize we want it to be about us, but it's not. It, it's just not. If we want it to, we're just built that way. We're selfish. We think that way. Well, this is all about me. Look what I did. And this says, no, no, no. This was created by him created through him, and created for him. That's the kind of authority that Jesus Christ has. It says something similar in, in Colossians chapter 2, but there's, I just want you to know, where, you can look up some of these verses, but look up Hebrews chapter 1 and read about the superiority of Jesus over the angels and all of the other created beings. Take a look at um, 1 Peter chapter 5 where he's called the chief shepherd. He's the one who is the, the overseer of all of the overseers. Don't ever let an authority in the church tell you that he knows something better than what Jesus does because Jesus is the chief shepherd. Jesus is the chief overseer. He's the one who, who leads. James, the author of the book of James, the half-brother of Jesus, calls himself not the half-brother of Jesus. He calls himself a slave to Jesus because he recognizes his authority. In Jude, we see that an angel wouldn't even, there was some dispute between an angel and, and, um, and a demon over the, the body of, um, over the body of Moses. I don't even know what that is. Don't, I mean, I, I don't even know how to explain any of that. I have no idea what was happening there. I really don't. But here's the thing about it. That angel wouldn't even go against him without saying, in the name of Jesus, because that's where the angel's authority even comes from. In the book of Revelation, just read Revelation 19. Wow. I mean, just to see the power and the authority with which Jesus comes and commands all of the angelic beings to come down and begin the battle of Armageddon, to see the majesty that he comes with and the power that he comes with and the confidence and the authority to, to watch all of that and to know that's the very same Jesus right now that died on the cross for you and me so that you and I could come to know him, so you and I could come under his authority. There's no better place. You don't want to be in the dominion of darkness. You want to be in the kingdom of a God who loves you, of a Savior who's willing to have given his life so that you could have life. That's where you want to be. Two questions for us as we wrap up. First, why are you waiting to submit to his authority in our lives? Why are you waiting to submit? Have you followed Jesus Christ? Have you given your life to him? Have you said, I'm gonna be a follower of Jesus? Have you done that? And maybe if you have, then my question for you is, how are you doing it living every day and every moment for him? In submission to him. Following what his word says. And unquestionably obeying it. The second question is, why are we waiting to call upon his authority for victory in our lives? Folks, that's, I think, maybe the bigger question. Why do we wait to call on his authority for victory in our lives? Why do we keep trying to do it ourselves? We, we keep trying to say, I'm going to fix this, and then I'll live for Jesus. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix this, and, and then I'm going to be a better testimony. You know, the better testimony is to say, I couldn't fix it. But Jesus Christ came into my life and he helped me. And he gave me the healing. He gave me the, the spiritual strength. And he gave me the ability to say no to sin and yes to righteousness. And every single day, that's what we face. And why do we wait to call upon the authority of Jesus to see victory in our lives? I, myself included. Because God wants us to experience victory. He wants us to experience that, that joy in our lives. He wants us to live on that threshold of glory, of seeing what God can do and watching him work and watching him do stupendous things that we can never even imagine. And I'm not just talking about like, the crazy miracles. I'm talking about just living our daily lives and, and being able to overcome sin and being able to, con to, to have a control in our lives that, that helps our mouths stop when they need to stop 
and our minds stop when they need to stop and to redirect in the direction that they need to go. Why do we wait? Because we need to give our lives to Jesus Christ wholly, completely, fully, letting him just engulf every aspect of how we live our lives. I, I can't say that with enough passion because I, it, it eats me up inside to know how I sin. It eats me up inside to see how, how some of you sin. And I, I, I'm, not, I'm not pointing fingers. We all do it. It just eats me up inside because I know there's a greater power at work within us that wants us to live victoriously and wants us to say no to sin and yes to Jesus every day, every minute, so that we might be able to see greater people come to Jesus, so that we can see things happen that we could never explain on our own. And it's only because of Jesus Christ that they happen. That's what we're looking for. And it takes a decision you and I have to make every single day, every single moment sometimes, just to be able to make a right decision for him. What does that look like for you today? Would you stand with me right now? And if you, if you want here at the end of the service, I know we're out of time, and if you're watching the clock, just ignore the clock for a few minutes. Your kids will be okay. Um, we're gonna sing one more song, but if you wanna pray after the service, there will be some people right over here in the prayer room that you can go and you can pray with. They'll pray for you. They're trained to just talk to you and listen and, and to pray with you. But if you wanna do that, and if you wanna just take a minute and do that, that would be amazing. If you don't, um, find somebody right around you that you can pray with and do that. Because I can promise you this, um, uh, we need to take action. We need to take that step. We need to take that immediate step. And, and my question is the very title of our message, why are we waiting and responding to Jesus? Why wait? Let's pray together. Father, I just ask that today, right now, right here, that you would just be glorified. God, I pray that your words would be powerful and, and stick in us so that we might be able to be transformed as a result, that we might be able to be changed God, I pray that you would work in us in such a mighty way and that, God, as we, as we would finish here today, that, that, God, we would lift our voices and sing mighty praises to you and that, God, you would get all the glory and you would get all the honor and that we would submit each and every day and each and every moment to your authority. God, if there's somebody here right now that needs somebody to pray with them, I pray, God, they would make their way to the prayer room and that there would be someone that, that they would be able to connect with right then that would give them a chance to be able to pray together and, and to just turn their lives over to you in one more level of obedience. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Everyone needs compassion love that's never failing let mercy fall on me everyone needs forgiveness the kindness of a savior the hope of nation Savior, 
use of the prayer room, please do it. Uh, if you can help us tear down chairs, that would be great. Uh, God bless. Have a happy Sunday.